My name is Flo Fu. I'm a musician, director. I love aviation so much. People started to call me Air Flo. And、um, now I'd like to introduce the man who gave、uh, fighter pilots to so many of us out there. Please welcome my friend Bert Rutan. Something that I thought would impress my brother. It was when I was、uh, flying model airplanes and getting trophies,、uh, even at the nationals AMA、uh, meet. And I thought, now I can now I can bond with my brother because I'm doing aviation things and winning trophies. Unfortunately, it happened at exactly the same time that my brother. Left home and joined the Air Force, and uh, the uh, my my memory of of what happened in those days. Keep in mind、uh, the Vietnam War. We're we're, we're talking about 1965 to 1972. During that time, I was working、uh, at Edwards Air Force Base as a flight test engineer. Uh, we didn't have the internet. We didn't. We didn't have、uh, cell phones.、Uh, we had very, very little communication. And while he was over there、uh, fighting the war, and, and uh, uh, he would he would send back little、uh, reel-to-reel quarter-inch tapes that were audio, and to to give his family kind of a of a taste for what. What he was going through, and uh, uh, it was something that we didn't find out about right away. We 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 just didn't know. You know, I guess when you don't know, that's good news, right? But、um, later, Dick、um, had a. Engine problem with an F-100, and he did a second ejection、uh, in England, and、uh, that also,、uh, I, I, I don't really recall that so much because I was working really, really hard in those days.、Um, during that time, I was never home when the sun was up.、Uh, Saturdays and Sundays were just like Tuesdays and Wednesdays. But、um, just don't think much of fighter pilots. <laughs> they don't know how to test airplanes. They don't know how to come back and tell the engineer、uh, CN beta is too low, or our our dust roll damping is needs to be fixed. There's a problem that Dick ran into, and that is、uh, there were a lot more test pilots. It's still it's still true now because of all the unmanned stuff. There were a lot more test pilots than there were jobs for them. And if you if you've got an opening that you want to hire a test pilot, and you get a stack of resumes. You go through them, and the first thing you look for is what experience do you have as a test pilot? Now, Dick was a wartime hero. He、uh, he did some phenomenal things, 
but he, uh, he didn't have any experience as a test pilot. And I think he came to work for me mainly out of frustration that he, that he wanted to take that first step and, and someday be a, a big uh, famous test pilot. Somebody so famous that he would win the Kinchlow Award with the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. So he, and he didn't behave very well. <laughs> Dick certainly knew how to fl fly, but he didn't know how to fly straight and level. <laughs> and at a time when, when I had sold a whole bunch of plans and we got these home builders uh, uh, building airplanes and, and tempted to do aerobatics in them, even though they were never uh, uh, developed and proven for aerobatics. Well, Dick didn't have anything. He didn't want to do that. He, he went out and would, well, I'll give you an example. We were doing an 85% scale uh, starship uh, for Beechcraft, which gave them the, the basic aerodynamic data that they needed to make a decision to go and spend a lot of money and develop uh, the starship replace the King Airs. I remember being there, we were walking out on the ramp and the Starship, Dick's flying it. He comes down on a taxiway just right in front of the building. Really smoking, he pulls it up like this and this three aileron rolls. And a business airplane now. This is when the Beach Boys weren't looking. <laughs> Finally, they got really mad and said, listen, if you're not going to do that this year. You're, you're developing an airplane for the business people. Uh, we don't want to get a reputation that this is a fighter or an aerobatic airplane. Because everything that Dick flew, he flew it like it was a fighter. He would start with my very easy at Mount Whitney. Does everybody know where that is, the highest? highest mountain uh, in, uh, in the continental United States, 14,500 feet. And it's the headwaters of the Kern River. And the Kern River goes all the way to Bakersfield. And about half of that time, it's in a sheer cliff like this with a river. And he would put my very easy right on the water, just 10 feet off the water, and fly all the way to Bakersfield. <laughs> now, if the engines so much as hiccuped, not only would we, I lose my airplane, but I'd lose my brother, and likely it'd be really hard to find the wreckage. So, uh, he wanted me to design an aerobatic airplane for him. And I had already decided to not do that at RAF because the accident rate of aerobatic airplanes is many times what it is on non-aerobatic airplanes. But Dick wanted to, he wanted to compete with me and do, and do a uh, aerobatic airplane and sell, sell kits and plans for it. <laughs> about design, he knew that I could do it, you know, and uh, I had already done a whole bunch of different designs. Uh, but I told him, I tell you, there is one thing I'll do for you, and that is I have just discovered with some basic calculations that it is possible to fly an airplane all the way around the world uh, not refueled. And that would be a huge milestone. And as soon as I laid that in front of him, all of a sudden Dick had this enormous passion for getting this milestone. And he and Gina went out and spent years trying to raise money so that somebody could do that, uh, could fund it. And Voyager took up a lot more time than he thought. He thought all oh, Bert builds these home builds 
three or four months, he can do a, this round the world airplane in 10 or 11 months, maybe. I think it took about six years, roughly six years. And it's really, it's really something to be proud when, you're, when your airplane hangs in the Air and Space Museum in the Milestones of Flight Gallery. And uh, every time I'm in there, look at it again. No. And I look at Spaceship One also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving several talks uh, at uh, 1130 starting tomorrow for four days in a row. And one of them is about this uh, celebration that it's the 50th anniversary which started in 1974 when I sat down and put two things together. One is a high efficiency, um, not like the very big, and it was very low efficiency, but a high efficiency airplane. Uh, and on top of that, the challenge was, um, I, I, I didn't think at first that people could safely build an airplane using bed sheets and honey. <laughs> Airplanes are things that you get 4130 tubes and you weld them together to make a fiber cover kind of thing. They are, you bend aluminum and make a T-18. Or you glue some wood together like I did on the very big end. But this was really all new and it was done uh, at, with a big focus on low cost. So uh, because of that, it's done without uh, tooling. That sort of thing ended up with, uh, for me and the new company that I formed, which never had more than five employees, Rutan Aircraft Factory, where we had built a bunch of different airplanes and couldn't give if uh, Beechcraft was still in business. <laughs> uh, that's, it'll be an inside story of some things that you've never seen written down. And it's, uh, it's one that I thought I may ne never share with an audience or may never publish, but uh, I am gonna publish that story in detail and uh, and the thing that I'm putting all of my archival data online. I'm not doing a book. I'm doing. I'm, uh, I've just released uh, 4,800 photographs, uh, and and they're arranged by the 90 different chapters in the thing that I call Berkeley 10 autobiography. The reason that I'm unveiling four new designs that I want to get built is that they're all super interesting and exciting. If they weren't, why would I do something else that's boring after I've done some other things that are interesting? <laughs> so if you come on Thursday, <laughs> if you come on Thursday, you're going to see for the very first time some, some new airplanes. And, um, some new, some new projects that I think you'll in, enjoy looking at. But um, I wanted to get out of California for a number of reasons. A number of reasons why a lot of people have, have populated the 60% population increase in a small town in North Idaho. And uh, I managed to get my son and my daughter and their spouses and their kids, even great grandkids, I managed to get them out of California and go up there. But I couldn't get... But I, I, there's something really missing, and that is the opportunities that I should have had 
to bond with my brother. When I say bond, you know, do things together. Have the same friends. And go out to dinner together. And uh, finally, uh, Dick didn't move mainly because his, uh, his wife had family uh, locally there in, in the California desert, and she didn't want to leave her family. What happened is all her family left and went to Tennessee. <laughs> and all of a sudden now, Dick had a kitchen pass. He could move. He originally wanted to move to Bend, Oregon. Because he said, Coeur Lane, Idaho is not big enough for both of us brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got to shorten the story by telling you that, that uh, uh, almost three years ago, Dick did move up to North Idaho. And all of a sudden, just like that, Dick and I had the same friends. We were closest. For the, for the last three years of his life, we were, we were close buddies like we should have been when I was a kid. All of a sudden, uh, and you know, he, had, he enjoyed that so much up there. He was, he, every day he would say, God, I'm glad I came up here, you know. Uh, airplanes. And nobody, who's in the memorial should wear anything more formal than a t-shirt. <laughs> Dano, Dano is, who's the, uh, the, the logo maker, the, the artist, he did all the coffee cups, uh, you know, he did the letterheads, he did the, the coffee cups and water for Christmas. Dano designed this this, uh, this logo. Yeah, I'll turn around and show it to you. I was gonna turn around and what we have here is the barracoot, bear his barracoot pulling up in Missing Man, an F-100 and a Voyager, of course, and then uh, on the bottom, the American flag. And on, so, the front, and on the front, it says the velvet arm. Oh yeah, it says the velvet arm, Dick Rutan. Backstage, I told, uh, I, I told uh, Bill that, you know, a lot of people who come to Oscars don't know anything about airplanes. They're just like, oh, we'll go there for the food and the air show. <laughs> you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, hey, I saw Dick Rutan. Because on the shirt it says Dick Rutan. <laughs> I wish I could give every one of you one of these shirts, but we did we did make 400 of them and passed them out at the memorial that we had up at at, at uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We did surround. We did it in a hangar, a huge hangar, and we did surround it with airplanes, interesting airplanes. He did a lot of the flight tests with me on the boomerang. Trace, where's Trace? He has, he has a boomerang here. He landed right in front of us. Um, kilometers, something yeah. like that. Yeah, 1,500 kilometers. He set a record in the catbird. So we had the boomerang and the catbird. We had Nick's bear coot there, which is now hanging in the bird museum. Next to, next to my hangar at Fort Lane Airport. And we had the Starship, because Dick flew the first flight in the first Starship. I'm gonna tell a little anecdote about that, that because it's, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, Beechcraft had four different presidents during the Starship program. The first one didn't pay much attention to it. It was a covert research program that probably wouldn't go anywhere. I never even met Burns. The next one was Lyndon Blue, the visionary. 
we had called that airplane Next Generation Business Aircraft. And that pronounces NIGBA. <laughs> now, if you say NIGBA nowadays, it's not a good thing to say. <laughs> Lyndon Blue is the one that says he's going to call this Starship One. And he wanted Starship Two to be a turbo fan. And then maybe he wanted Starship Three to go to Mars. I don't know. But you know, he had that kind of a almost Musk like uh, uh, thing about do we do anything in the future? And we had Jim Walsh, and we had the president of Raytheon, which is the parent company for Beechcraft. All of those guys thought that it was good for Beach to uh, to do something new, inventive, something different. And if you come to my talk on Friday, you're going to find out something that will shock you. about the difference between folk who, uh, who are afraid of change, are afraid of innovation. Let's get back to Dick. I'm a big hug. But you know, if you make him laugh, he'd start coughing. And I knew if I pull him up and give him a hug, I might kill him. <laughs> I, I just, I, I didn't know what to do, so what I did is something I learned to do when I worked for the Air Force, a proper salute, and he gave me a proper salute back, and that's the last time I saw him, uh, and I really appreciate being able to share with you uh, the memory of Dick. One of the things that I'm going to do, I think it's on Wednesday, I'll have to check the calendar. Dick gave a talk at the Voyager mock-up, a fuselage mock-up in the museum every day here at Oshkosh, uh, every year. And I'm going to do one of his talks right there at the, at the, at the, uh, I think it's, I think it's 2.30 or something like that at, at the museum. It's on, it's on the program. on my shelf uh, 
uh, had a lot to do with, with, with my passion to get into aviation. Uh, there's a sign that uh, uh, a concept you had an idea on but had not acted on. You're going to see four of those on uh, Thursday at my talk. Uh, now, you keep in mind, when people would ask me that before, they think that they have a right to look at what I'm working on. <laughs> but uh, I always ask them, I says, well, can I name, you know, 10 or 20 of these 40-some airplanes? I said, did you know anything about that before it was flight tested? Oh, <laughs> I guess I didn't. The beauty of that is nobody knows anything about it, and it's a failure, like ski goal. You don't have to tell anybody. <laughs> and not all these airplanes that I did um, flew very well. You're going to see a lot of that in my in my talk tomorrow. <laughs> and the reason is, why do something that's less significant and less interesting than you've done 40 times before? Why, why, why bother? Right? You know, why not just, while you're still healthy, uh, retire and go to Idaho or something? <laughs> so, uh, I was extremely fortunate at scale well, excuse me, we were extremely fortunate at RAF because we sold a bunch of, can I say the word, a shitload of plans? <laughs> 1975. You got gas now. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, 1975, when it flew here, uh, very easy. And uh, I had uh, decided not to sell plans for this airplane because it had a Volkswagen engine that failed twice. We set a distance record during the show in 1975. The October 75 uh, issue of Sport Aviation, most of, the, most of the magazine is that story that Jack Cox wrote. But anyway, I went home and said, listen, this is, I, I, I can't be putting out something that people are gonna have accidents with. I've got to do, if I'm going to do a home built kit or plan, it's got to have an aircraft engine. It's got to be reliable. And that's why the home builders, very easy, is 15% bigger and was designed around the Continental O200 engine. And uh, there were a lot of them on the, you know, the home builders in those days didn't, they seemed like the people I worked with didn't have any money at all. That's why I didn't charge much for the plan. <laughs> And, uh, but after a while, uh, you couldn't find a used O200. <laughs> so the, I guess it's a joke, we, we said, well, the way to get an O200 is to find a real windy day, and go out on the ramp and untie all the Cessna 150. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, a reason that the longing was done uh, is that this one could handle a Lycoming engine with a starter and an alternator, or as he couldn't. And uh, I know some of you did it anyway, but he couldn't. <laughs> um, there's another real important reason that I did the longing that we've never admitted. And I'm going to talk about that, I think, at the talk tomorrow. <laughs> and my best advice is, yeah, you should go out and learn the math and learn the physics and, and, and get, in, uh, uh, get, a, get a college education engineering, but be damn sure that you ignore most of the classes because they're things that you shouldn't know. <laughs> you shouldn't poison your mind while you're learning uh, physics. 
<laughs> mathematics and design. Uh, my advice is don't go to work for a, a big time, like Boeing or Lockheed or Beechcraft. Exactly. Just don't do it. I graduated from college exactly halfway between Yuri Gagarin's space flight and the moon landing, right? 1965, right in the middle. I didn't go into space. They were crying for engineers. They had people that were designing the rocket motors that were that were people that weren't engineers, but they were they were their car racing guys, and they knew how what makes a car engine blow up. And, the, and they had those guys designing the, the rocket engines, uh, and they couldn't we couldn't get enough people because that that thing. Uh, um, a challenge uh, to to get our national prestige back. That hey, we got we got people on the moon. That'll do it. But you know, we lost uh, the Sputnik thing and we lost the Gagarin thing. Not because of technical. If we'd have flown one less monkey, we'd have got the uh, the Gagarin thing. <laughs> and von Braun had in storage, the rocket that could have put the first artificial satellite, and it wouldn't let him do it because it was a military rocket. They wanted us to look like uh, uh, peaceful people, so our satellite, even though the Russians uh, put the first satellite up on something that was designed to nuclear bomb America, you know, they didn't, they thought that was bad, and so they wouldn't let Von Braun do it. When people would ask me what's my favorite airplane that I worked on, uh, I don't, I'd always say the next one, right? But after 2004, I didn't say the next one. I said Spaceship One. I knew right then that it was very unlikely. See, I, I don't have this vision that Elon Musk has. I wish I did. But I, I knew right then that I can't beat that. I can't beat anything that's that, that's that important. You know, I, I had a, a heart attack when, when I was 55 years old. And, uh, and I knew I wasn't gonna be able to work really. You know, I, I, I retired. I didn't retire, I did the damn ski go, but I retired at, at 67 years old. Now, I think if I'd have been healthy, I'd still be in Mojave doing airplanes. I probably would. It was just that much fun, wasn't it, uh, Zach? Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're all six scale, count me, six scale presidents could be together, and we got some neat pictures. Well, you're, you're talking about the culture. Someone asked that there's a rule at scale that if you make a mistake, Fired. Well, if you make a mistake, you're you're probably the, the most reliable guy because you're not going to make it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, out there that have built your own airplane and flew it to this show, you know how hard it is. Somebody that visits Oshkosh and sees all these hundreds of home built airplanes, they think it's easy. But at Britain Aircraft Factory, we kept records. And we had, uh, I think it was like 14,000 people building from our plans. And like every other kit built or plans built airplane, actually, uh, ran the, the RV airplanes. They, 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 they busted that rule because they're cheating. <laughs> they put out a kit where all the holes are. But anyway, the statistic is that only 10% of the people that start ever fly the airplane. Mm -hmm. And another statistic that, that is based on RAF data that I've never seen published anywhere else, and that is if you if you build an airplane from scratch and fly it, 
It'll cost you 1.6 wives. <laughs> <laughs> on your whole trip you've got a pretty heavy battery and a pretty expensive battery let me give you a statistic if you buy a Tesla and I own a Tesla I love the fact that it drives itself just fun if you buy a Tesla you have hurt the environment from the day you build it by about 100,000 miles of driving because the energy and the carbon that goes in the atmosphere in order to make that battery is that much. And they warranty the battery for 70,000 uh, 70, miles. So you don't break even until 100,000. Now, Dano's broken the rule. How many miles do you have in your Tesla? 116. And you could be charging it on a full fire. You know, no, but anyway, uh, they don't they don't help the environment at all. <laughs> just like uh, just like this, uh, what is it? Uh, oil made from corn. It doesn't help the environment. Uh, and and, 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 and yeah. A lot of people don't realize that the wind industry is not an energy industry. You know that the energy it takes which is all done with fossil fuels to make a wind generator, in its lifetime, it doesn't ever generate that much energy. In other words, it can't re re replicate itself. You don't, you don't use wind energy to go out and mine the core and then run the foraging and run the trucks and, and to build all these things. You don't, you don't do that. It's, it's a pretty simple calculation to show that the only ways that we have a wind energy uh, industry is that the government subsidizes it. It can't survive on its own because it doesn't make net energy. It must be a boy. Okay, I had picked my favorite spaceship and my favorite airplane. And uh, my favorite airplane was the A-12, forerunner of the SR-71. I think that's a friggin' beautiful airplane. And, and the most important spaceship is the, is the uh, lunar module. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fantastic. And if you don't believe that, look at, look at the trouble that NASA is going through right now, trying to get somebody to build something that will do that. They are going in at night in the Air and Space Museum. Musk to go to the moon in his other starship. <laughs> He's got to refuel it in Earth orbit five to ten times. Well, for crying out loud, the Saturn. One launch, it went there and came back. Just one launch. The Saturn V is a so much more brilliant design than the Starship. They're, they're, they're not even in the same league. Now that being said, I have a lot of respect for Musk by the fact that he initially proved that it is indeed impossible to reuse a booster for an orbital launch. He proved that. It's impossible. He proved that about six times. <laughs> and then one of them made it. <laughs> and he wrapped in all of those mistakes 
and he can go out there reliably. And he's got, he's flown, I think, like 26 flights on one boost. And because of that, he's, he essentially puts the other, the other space launch people out of business. They can't be printing rocket motors. The, the little paths where you have to run a fluid to keep them from burning, and then you have to solder them together. Boy, 3D printing, this is a, the only way to do that, right? But here's the thing, 3D printing is, is a very slow process. You know, it only makes sense for things that are so complex that you have to 3D print them, essentially. Uh, last question before we start uh, the receiving line here is just uh, out of all the airplanes you ever flew, what was your favorite? Boomerang. Boomerang. By far. Fantastic. Yeah. It, it, it had, I had certain goals for it in terms of its safety and efficiency. Now, the, the Boomerang, if you look at it carefully, it, there's a lot of attention to detail. It doesn't have flaps, for example, even though it has a more than 40 pound wing loading. Uh, I knew it was going to be safe because it had two engines and it was not going to have the normal engine out accidents. So, you know, I checked off that clip, but uh, I wasn't interested in, I couldn't, I couldn't think of a time when I went out and landed the Duchess in a little grass field, even though it could do it. So I didn't pay attention to that and to, and to make that thing have the coast to coast range and to make it be able to fly at 260 knots with four-cylinder light bulbs, uh, to make it do that, I had to have small wings on it. And that's why it has such a heavy wing loading. Now, the big advantage is turbulence. It drives through turbulence like, like it's not there compared to another uh, typical airplane with a low wing loading. It's by far my favorite general aviation work. No, no, nothing's even close to that. That's, that's wonderful. And I just want to say.